Is this on? It is on. Good morning, Your Holiness. It's wonderful to have you here. And to you and to the esteemed director of this institute, to the faculty and staff, to all of the visitors and students and friends, I wish you all a welcome to the second day of this really extraordinary dialogue. And I wish to use just a very few minutes at the beginning to extend my personal congratulations and thanks once again to the Central Institute of the Higher Tibetan Studies on the occasion of this 50th anniversary. Jose Cabazon yesterday talked about some of the things that the Institute does of which people may not be aware, and I want to extend that a little bit because this Institute has also been a leader in international exchange. And Your Holiness, this is, as you know, largely due to your efforts when 27 years ago you instructed me and Samdong Rinpoche to establish this exchange program which has now been going for 26 years between the five colleges and now Australia and this institution. Um, academic exchange is such an important thing for universities and especially for a community like the Tibetan community that is really entering and integrating with the rest of the world. Um, and this university has been um, a, a real leader in that, in that field under the leadership of His Holiness the Dalai Lama, uh, the most venerable Professor Samdong Rinpoche, and Geshe Ngawang Samten. But I, many people don't understand the full scope of the exchange, so I want to spend a few minutes explaining that. It's not just that we bring students here and that students from this institute and from Tseni Lopta go to study in the West. We also exchange faculty members with West teachers from the West coming here and to other Tibetan institutions and Tibetan teachers coming to the West to teach. We engage in joint research, Tibetan linguistics, cognitive science, medicine, Buddhist philosophy, comparative philosophy, major research programs that have been involved. The exchange model has spread from here to the Institute of Buddhist Dialectics and the library under the leadership of Geshe Lakdor and with the uh, work so many years ago of Gen Lobsang Gyatso. Um, it's been an extraordinary effort, but the leadership has, has always been here and this is something to congratulate um, the Institute on. But I also want to make sure that when we think about this program, we recognize not only the leaders who you see up here on the stage, but also all of the teachers and students who have been involved in this, all of the staff members. It's one of those occasions when we congratulate the institution on its success, then when we can remind ourselves of the importance of dependent origination and of how much anything that any institution or any individual achieves depends upon the kindness and the contribution and the leadership of so many others. And to use this occasion not only to celebrate the Institute, but to rededicate ourselves to repaying that kindness. So thank you very much, Your Holiness, for your leadership in this venture, and Geshe Ngawang Samten for your leadership um, in this exchange work. And now I introduce our first speaker to the day, Professor Asanga Tilakaratne, one of the great experts on Theravada Buddhist philosophy. So, very good morning to everybody, Your Holiness, uh, distinguished um, guests, scholars gathered here, uh, let me first uh, uh, express my uh, gratitude to uh, Venerable Geshe Samten, the Vice Chancellor of this university, uh, for inviting me for this occasion to speak on uh, Theravada concept of mind. And uh, also, I am uh, given this opportunity for me to be fortunate enough uh, to uh, express my ideas in the presence of uh, His Holiness and uh, this distinguished gathering. Uh, so uh, without much further ado, let me get into the uh, subject matter which I would like to discuss for this morning. Basically, what I'm going to do is to discuss the concept of uh, mind in uh, Theravada Buddhism. When I say Theravada Buddhism, uh, what I mean by that is basically the Buddhist Pali Tripitaka, three canonical literature, and also the subsequent uh, tradition that was developed in Theravada, such Theravada countries as Myanmar, Sri Lanka, and uh, the places. So uh, when we uh, discuss uh, the problem of uh, mind um, in uh, Indian philosophy, basically generally in Indian philosophy, and today we are coming to the 
idea of uh, mind in uh, Theravada Buddhism. So first uh, let me articulate the idea as it found in the basic uh, discourses of the Buddha and subsequently for me to go to some of the later developments in order to understand what do we mean by mind. So uh, when I followed the discussions uh, whole yesterday, I can see that still we are struggling with the concept of the basic, very basic uh, idea that what is the mind we are talking about. I think uh, this very understanding, the effort to understand this concept uh, is very important uh, in clarifying what we mean by this concept. Now, when I look at the uh, Theravada tradition, we know that uh, in this tradition, the Atma has been replaced by uh, mind. Now, one of the unique and key features of the Buddha's teaching was to uh, get rid of this agent in the substantial sense. Having removed the agent or Atman from the scene, Buddhism uh, attributes the function that was generally attributed to Atman to the concept of mind. Now, this innovative teaching has not been uh, very easy to grasp even for the Buddhist, the followers of the Buddha themselves. Now, in the canon, we have this, uh, uh, I mean, there are many, many instances. One very uh, well-known instance is uh, a bhikkhu named Sati, who believed that it is the vijnana. Of course, he, he, he accepted that there is no Atma, but in that place, he believed that it is the vijnana that uh, goes through the, from birth to birth without any change. And then Buddha said that this idea is wrong, and he said vijnana is dependently arisen. So in other words, whether you accept vijnana or anything, if it is, doesn't change, then of course it is tantamount to Atman. So Buddha said that vijnana is dependently arisen. In the same manner, we, we, we have, there are many instances. In another inst instance, uh, a monastic disciple called, um, um, yeah, one monastic disciple, actually um, he thought that Molya uh, Pagguna, he thought that uh, somebody, there is someone who is partaking the nutrition of consciousness, vijnana, ahara. Then Buddha said, that question is wrong. And then he rephrased the question, for what is the nutriment consciousness a condition? So in other words, you can see that getting rid of the agent from the scene and attributing uh, causality or understanding the whole process as a dependently arisen phenomenon. So interestingly, we can see that in the Buddhist analysis, mind has been assigned, mind has been put into the place of Atman. Now what is this concept of mind in the Buddhist literature? When we think about this, we come across three key concepts found in the discourses, basically Chitta, Mano and Vijnana. Uh, I'm not going to do a in great, uh, great detailed study of these uh, three concepts in the morning, but just to understand uh, what these three concepts basically signify is an important thing. There are instances where Buddha uses these three concepts uh, synonymously. So in that sense, you can see that these three concepts are interchangeable. However, when you look at the literature, you can clearly see that three concepts are being used in three uh, very clearly uh, definable contexts. For example, when we talk about chitta, chitta is basically spoken of as chitta is that which can be polluted, chitta is that which can be developed, chitta is which is responsible for your um, whether good or bad birth, and so on. So when you look at the term chitta, you can see that chitta is basically the, we can say, emotional aspect of our mind. Uh, so chitta is spoken as uh, that which is liberated finally. In the Buddhist literature, ultimately we see this term very often uh, when the arahants describe their own status of mind, chittang asavehi vimucci. 
the mind was liberated from the defilements. So the chitta is basically that. And uh, when we come to mano or manas, again we can see that manas is basically used as an indriya or faculty. So with eye, ear, tongue, nose and all these things, the sixth indriya is manas, which has its own domain, own subject matter, namely um, the phenomena or dharmas. In addition to that, manas uh, plays a very important role as the coordinator of all the other senses. Now this is very interesting because the, according to Buddhist analysis, uh, eye has to be combined with mano in order to see. So the, it's called mind consciousness and the eye consciousness arises in connection, in association with mind. So in that sense, mano has its own domain of phenomena. At the same time, it, uh, uh, it goes through, it coordinates the domains of all the other senses. Now that is basically mano. And when we come to the idea of vijnana, vijnana is very interesting. Vijnana, or the, what we call consciousness, is basically the consciousness of uh, associated with sensory faculties. Ear consciousness, eye consciousness, and so on. Chakshu Indriya, and, and so on. So uh, this is basically the idea of uh, consciousness. In addition to that, consciousness also has, uh, uh, in the dependent origination formula, you have consciousness as a part of uh, human experience and human entity. So in, in addition to being uh, Indriya, it has this aspect of um, five skandhas. So when we speak about the human being, human being is understood as having rupa, vedana, sanya, sankhara, and vijnana. All these five uh, aggregates. So in the five aggregates, vijnana is one of the key important things. So this is another aspect of vijnana. In addition to these two things, vijnana is also spoken of as that which connects your, this present birth to the next birth. So that part is also played by the vijnana, according to early discourses. And in addition to all these three, there is a fourth aspect, which is described in a Pali term called uh, sangvattanika vijnana, that vijnana that continues through. So the, the continuation of the psychological mental process throughout one's birth is also described in vijnana. Now, this is, a, as you can see, very, very brief, um, you, you know, the exposition of Chitta Mano Vijnana. Of course, this has been uh, ex, uh, extensively dealt with by, uh, by scholars, so, but I don't want to go into this. Now, basically, you can see that although Chitta Mano and Vijnana are spoken of as synonymous, but still you can see that they capture a vast area of psychological import in the Buddhist literature. So ultimately this is very important how to define this phenomenon called consciousness or mind. So according to Buddhism you can see that uh, it's very difficult to define it with one definitive term. It has to cover a large area. Now when we look at the early Buddhist uh, Theravada uh, analysis of mind one very important thing we can see is the fact that it is something dependently arisen. Now, of course, it is completely, it contrasts with the Atma, which is independent, independently existing, but the important thing is Vijnana or mind is dependently arisen. As the Buddha said to this, his disciple Sati, Vijnana is always dependently arisen. Now, what it means is ultimately, when you talk about eye consciousness or ear consciousness, for example, it is not something that exists all the time. Based on eye, based on ear, based on any other faculty, this consciousness arises. So that is what it means to be dependently arisen. In other words, we cannot talk about vijnana or mind per se. A vijnana is always a specific vijnana. Mind is always a specific mind. Um, when we see something, we have eye consciousness and so on. Now, uh, you might 
think how can we this consciousness is always depend dependently arisen. What about when you don't have anything coming from your senses? Of course, there is an answer for that subsequent Buddhist tradition uh, came up with the idea called bhavanga. Bhavanga means life continuum, which according to the subsequent Abhidharma tradition is mind continues through your life. So you have what is called the pratisandhi chitta or the, the with which you are born. And finally, at the end of the life, you have what is called chuti chitta with which your life is concluded. In between, you, can, you have the bhavanga process goes on unbroken. But bhavanga process is conditioned or dependently arisen on karma. So therefore, you can see that the basic idea of dependently arisen nature is retained, but the bhavanga process is there. Now, the philosophical significance of this is when we are talking about um, the, the consciousness or mind, we are always talking about uh, not only one single thing, but the whole network of things. Now, important philosophical implications of this is very often we talk about this mind-body problem as if mind and body are existing independently. However, in the Buddhist tradition, this problem does not arise mainly because you, you don't talk about the mind as independently existing. If it is chakku vinyana, sota vinyana, or the consciousness of eye or ear or whatever, it depends on various other factors. So in other words, there is no, in the Buddhist tradition, this mind-body problem because you are not talking about mind or you are not talking about body, of course, as if they exist separately. But... In the Buddhist tradition, you always come across references to mind, references to mano, references to vijnana. It is basically the, the way to talk about it. But we have to understand that every time we are talking about vijnana, we are talking about a particular vijnana. Every time we are talking about mano, we are talking about the particular mano. Every time we are talking about the chitta, we are talking about the particular chitta. Not really chitta existing per se, or vinyana existing per se, or mind or mano existing per se. Now in that sense, when Buddhism is you know, the, talking about this whole phenomena, you can see that uh, it's, it's talking about the whole uh, network of things. Now this is something very important implications of this. And the next uh, important implication is when Buddhism talks about mind or chitta, mano, it makes it very clear that this particular phenomenon is very fast moving. In one place, the Buddha says that even you cannot talk about, I mean, there, you can't give a simile how fast it moves. It is, it is so fast. Now, this fastness has been, again, subsequent in the tradition, uh, has been captured in what is called the chana or the moment. So the, the mind has been analyzed to have three moments, nascent moment, existing moment, and also the perishing moment. But within that three moments, we might think that when we talk about three, it is a long duration. Of course, it is not long duration. Within that, that process has been also analyzed into 17. I don't have time to go into those things, but I'm just giving you some basic idea. Now, summarizing what I have been trying to say during these few minutes is basically the concept of mind in Buddhism is a very complex phenomenon. And also it is a dependently arisen phenomenon. Although we talk about mind or consciousness or anything, we are always, we have to understand that we are talking about a complex phenomenon. Now, soteriologically, the significance of this is when we really realize this we know that the mind arises without an agent, so the whole process arises without an agent. So in that sense, there is no agent, there is no Atman, but when the conditions are ripe, Buddha uses the, uh, the, the simile of an egg being hatched, when you know the, the, the hen uh, protects the eggs and ultimately it, it gets hatched without any extra effort. So that's, that's one important significance. The second important significance I would like to underscore here is when we try to understand the cognitive science, uh, the mind in this process or the consciousness in the process, I think 
we need to look at these all the aspects together and try to come up with some very important key features of what we talked about in the Buddhist uh, context as mind in order to uh, further our, our research on neuroconsciousness. So with these few remarks, let me wind up and thank you very much for listening to me. you to reflect on this talk. Thank you. But again, you and the Theravada slow, you know? Oh, that's it, that's Theravada. Theravada is the most important thing. The previous thing is the most important thing. Drawing. Drawing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Drawing, you know? That's the most important thing. Then that's the most important thing. actually defined on the basis of uh, monastic Vinaya code lineage and uh, maybe there are s few differences amongst them but I usually prefer to use the Pali tradition and Sanskrit tradition so because Theravada is one uh, sect of within the uh <laughs> So this is a sort of a general uh, observation on how the, the Theravada tradition is understood from the Indo-Tibetan perspective. And generally in the Tibetan tradition, which is inherited from the Indian tradition, we tend to reserve the term, term Theravada for a particular lineage of Vinaya okay. that goes all the way back to the, the earliest, you know, kind of division into the four main schools, lineages, and Theravada is one of those very, very early lineages. Mola Sarvastivada tradition and the Theravada lineage and then Mahasamgika um, and we don't remember, <laughs> none of us can remember. What's it, Putraya is one of them. Um, yes. So the point his holiness is uh, making is that um, he finds it more helpful to distinguish historically between Pali tradition versus Mangubu. Sanskrit. Mangubu. Okay. Um, yeah, so um, Pali tradition versus Sanskrit tradition. And so a large part of the Indian and Indo-Tibetan tradition are in, you know, inheritors of the Sanskrit tradition. Mm -hmm. In the Theravada world, what we see is the Pali tradition, because otherwise Theravada is generally understood to be a term that is confined more to a lineage coming from the Vinaya. Right, right, right. Yeah. As far as the Vinaya is concerned, the Tibetan sort of Buddhist tradition, the, I think there are two, but major is Mula Sarvastivada. Mula Sarvastivada tradition. And the Pali tradition, Theravada tradition. These are lineage of Correct. Bhikshu Vau, yes, yes. not a different school of thought. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. There are little differences, but these are not, right. not Significant, uh, significant. Uh, significant. Uh, not significant. No. Yeah. And then, uh, they, uh, uh, some people used to use the word Mayana and Hinayana. Uh, I totally sort of uh, disfavor. Disfa disfa yeah, and not in favor of no. using those terms. Yeah. Mm -hmm. oh. You see, that create impression. Or oh, sometimes, you see, I telling people, the people who are supposed follow up Mayana and look down Hinayana. <laughs> oh. Then Hinayana people say, oh, Mayana, whether it is whether authentic Buddhist teaching or not. <laughs> no use. 
So in the, um, the, the, the Sanskrit tradition, one speaks of the three turnings of the wheel of Dharma. The first one is the basis of the Pali tradition. Well, the second and third, mainly Sanskrit. Mm -hmm. Some of my friends, even if you question, Buddha knows Sanskrit or not. <laughs> <laughs> So in any way, Pali tradition is the foundation of Buddha yeah, Dharma. Right. Yeah, oh. yeah, yeah. Oh. And then about Vinaya practice, mm -hmm. Shamadha, Vivasana, all this common. Yeah. And Four Noble Truth. And then 37 Kasa, 37 factors of uh, enlightenment. Mm -hmm. oh. Same. Right. Same. And Generally, in principle, anatma theory also say. Correct. Ah, uh, that the kasurde, lekjal chuki nani yine tamya vasaye. Shiv Sagu kanda the madrasa theam toh. So when we go into detail, of course, then even within the Sanskrit tradition, there's a lot of differences among the philosophical Buddhist philosophical schools on the interpretation of what exactly That's is the right. meaning of anatman. What is the what is that no self? Uh, First, the Chitta Mantra, different view, different understanding about Shunyata, and then Madhimika. Mm -hmm. And within these two, the subdivisions, there are a lot of differences mm -hmm. like that. But all, I think, they about Shunyata, more uh, Kasota, more explanation in Sanskrit tradition. Sanskrit text, yeah. Okay, wonderful. Thank you, Vendu. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, I should be thankful uh, to. Uh, I think <laughs> uh, before Tibetan Buddhist tradition, some Western scholar described Lamaism, <laughs> uh, whether it is authentic Buddhism yes. or not. <laughs> so Hind Hindu Tantra yes, right. and Buddhist, some kind of mixed. And right. Tibetan lamas also, you see, they prefer different sort of what say dance or different mask, right? <laughs> oh, and like puja or something. Yeah, yes, uh, yes, yes. So I think the the, the children of the church is a huge teacher. So sometimes the Tibetans themselves are to blame because they overemphasize right. the ritual aspect. That's right, that's right. So there is some sort of basis to describe Lamaism. <laughs> <laughs> now, many scholars begin to realize Tibetan Buddhist tradition is true Nalanda tradition. Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. Like that? Yeah, that's right. That's right. Uh, thank you, Wen. Thank you so much, uh, the, Your Holiness, for those comments, uh, very enlightening comments. Uh, within the Theravada tradition itself, we make a distinction between the early discourses and the subsequent developments in the Abhidharma. In fact, in my paper, I have mentioned that you know these subsequent concepts like uh, bhavanga, life continuum, in certain respects, of course, seem to be seem to be very faithful to the earlier tradition. But of course, there are cer certain innovations. But basic concept of anatma and the dependently arisen character of the mind has been retained uh, throughout. Now, in that sense, of course, we can talk about um, uh, you know the the a Buddhist concept of uh, mind in that sense. Yes. Thank you very much, Professor Hugo. Okay. Okay. It was a beautiful talk, but we now have to move on because it is time for Michelle Beeple to take the stage. <laughs>